Hello and welcome to another episode of Let's Discuss. My name is Zanide Masego and here with me today is the most beautiful woman, a wife, a mother and a um, clinical counsellor, mm-hmm. activist, mm. international speaker. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Author. <laughs> Among other things, there's a lot that you uh, have going on. Welcome, Gail Masando. Thank you? you. Thank you so much for having me today. This is exciting for me to be with you and your listening audience. It really, oh, is. really is. Thank you for mm-hmm. coming here and joining us, Auntie Gail. Um, before we go too far, we will open with a word of prayer. Mm. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we pray that you may be with us um, throughout this program. We pray that as we discuss, that nothing we say may be offensive, but rather that it may bring insight and a better perspective, Lord. Guide us through everything that we do. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay, so the topic today that that we're gathered here for is self-love. And sisterhood. Also, uh, you know, a double barrel, isn't it? Um, they each, great topics, they each deserve their own airtime because there's a lot in self love and a lot in sisterhood. I wonder if you wouldn't, wouldn't mind if I changed self love to self care for the sake of the discussion this evening. No, I wouldn't mind at all because um, I, I, we, we have been struggling with the, with the concept of self-love. Mm. What does it mean, mm. self-love? Is it loving yourself? And Well, you know, um, it's important because we've been, it's biblically correct in, um, when, when Jesus says the whole, all of the commandments rest on these two, just two. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind, and then your neighbor as yourself. Yourself. <clears throat> it's almost like a statement saying that he believes that who he was speaking to at the time and speaking to us now today, that there is a sense of self love, meaning in a healthy way, we respect ourselves, we, we honor our word. Our word is our bond. That's part of, you know, and, and we take care of ourselves. I mean, we pride ourselves in the Adventist church on the health message, right? So it's almost like a given. But God is inviting us through Jesus Christ for not just loving our, and, if, and this is Woman's Month, so just not loving our hair, our weave, our wigs, our heels, our makeup, our clothes. He's asking us to go a little deeper. Um, Some of us are not as happy with the figures we've been given, you know, the shapes. Do we, do you all say figures? Because I want to be current, you (laughs) know, the the figures or the shape, body shapes, you know, we're, Mm -hmm. we're finding, and and I get a little confused. I'm a New Yorker Mm -hmm. uh, here on the soil for a while now. But I get a little confused now that, that I'm seeing young African, South African women literally bleaching their skin or um, taking on now implants mm-hmm. in their bodies. And we say, well, we don't do that in our community of mm. faith. Yes, we do. And so that's concerning. That's not self-love. Someone would say, girl, you really taking care of? No, that's, that's uh, almost a sign of I'm not happy with what God did. So I'm going to do better. And self-love can get into worshiping ourselves. And the Bible is very clear. Thou shall have no other gods before me. And it can be so subtle. Mm. Now, when we're looking at self-care, I want to eat well. Mm-hmm. I want to get enough sleep. Um, I don't, you know, this gym obsession. Yes, yes. <laughs> but there's plenty of places to walk, even safe places to walk, even in Haotang. But, um Getting out, but make what I'm what I'm talking about is movement. Making sure that you're getting enough movement through your body, and that even the stresses we can't help but have stress, right? Me I too. stopped driving about ten years ago, and my son and my husband were like, "What are you talking about? You're not going to drive anymore." Well, 
I was not raised here, was not born here. We drive on the right side of the road, by the way, in mm -hmm. the States. Mm -hmm. I'm teasing, mm -hmm. but I had to think. You know, I'm always concentrating when I f first got here. Mm. But I was not used to vendors in the street. I was not, you know, you can buy everything on the street, right? There's mm -hmm. vendors coming, buy the car. And then there's the mothers with the children on the back. And in my heart, I would always say, one of those babies are going to jump off their mommy's back or whoever's back and run in front of my car, and I would just be stressed out. And so mm. I just decided, no, I can, you know, I can get up every morning and say to my husband, where are you going? Are you going past my office? You mm. can drop. I mean, I could find other ways to alleviate that stress. Self-care is about taking care of ourselves in such a way that we do not complicate, borrow anxiety, borrow stresses, borrow even, you know, the, the idea of I have to be all things to all people, I'm responsible for the world, that adds to. So I would like to, to kind of hang around the word self-care a little bit. So that would we're more clear on what we're talking about. Um, I'm more clear, <laughs> and I hope our listening audience will be. And yeah. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with self-love. It's just that I think we're being invited to take care of ourselves and loving ourselves in the context of healthy love, mm -hmm. respecting ourselves, honoring ourselves by taking care of ourselves is key. All right, so I'd, I'd like to, to go quickly into the story of Hannah. Yeah. And, and Penina. Yeah. So this is the story in First Samuel 1. And um, Penina is said to be um, Hannah's rival. And she would torment her for being childless. So um, what do we do when we have, in, in terms of self-care, you have a flaw that everyone else knows about. How do you rise above it? Well, you know... If, if we're using Hannah for an example, um, and she didn't have a flaw, really. Um, her desire for a child was, was sometimes missed, even when we're talking about her. Um, she was tormented by the second wife. Mm -hmm. But if you read that whole scripture, what's so interesting is we don't hear really Hannah responding to that. But we do hear Hannah respond to her husband who says, am I not enough mm -hmm. for you? And she's able to clearly say, no, you're not. And that would be, well, what was that about? What was going on with Hannah? Well, in those biblical days, a child represented, and particularly a male child, the presence of God in a woman's life. So what you hear Aunt Hannah saying is, I need to know. I got to know. Do I have God's presence? Do I have his okay? Mm -hmm. And it is because of that we find her bringing that baby back, right? She brings Samuel back to the temple. If it was just about having a baby, she never would have brought him back. So in, in, in that case, um, how, how do we rise above being ridiculed, uh, I suppose teased or humiliated mm -hmm. by other sisters mm -hmm. who don't love themselves? Yes, yes. Um, I think we get to a place where we admit that we are hurt not to try to brush it off like it didn't matter, because mm -hmm. it does matter. Um, even from the people that we don't necessarily even want to be in relationship with, it still hurts. We're flesh and blood. We hurt. Mm. One of the worst things we can do is ignore or be in denial about something that hurts. Now, our feelings are important. We're not to ignore our feelings, but we're not to be led around by them either. So it's almost getting to a place of saying and asking God for someone we can speak to about this hurts. Mm -hmm. I don't want to lay down and play dead, but how do I rise above it? And, and that comes in the idea of the self-care of knowing who and whose you are. And that doesn't happen overnight, particularly if you didn't have a father figure in your home. As a woman, we're talking about, right? If you didn't have a father figure to be the princess, 
Mm -hmm. be his princess. Um, and a lot of us have not had that. True. You know, so we're looking for, we're looking for affirmation. Um, and so we want to ask God to give us, bring into our lives, um, to heal us first, heal that wound, not ignore the wound, but heal the wound. And then ask God to bring us the right people in our lives. We're not an island. Sometimes when we get so hurt and humiliated, we isolate ourselves, and that actually brings more harm. Mm -hmm. um, but to ask God this and to admit to God and ask God for someone we can say, Zah, that hurt, you know? Such and such said, mm -hmm. you know, and, and hopefully to go, if, some, if God has brought the person into our lives, they'll be sensitive. They won't allow us to nurse the pain. Mm -hmm. They'll allow us to share what's going on, and, um, and then we can hopefully not move on, but move forward with new information about how wonderful we really, really are. And that was a person that was having a bad hair day. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. um, there's another, if I can share another example, you know, we have a Rachel and Leah, gosh, mm -hmm. Leah, poor Leah, mm -hmm. even the, even, when you're reading about Leah in Genesis, it says she wasn't attractive. It says it. It says it. You know, something's wrong with her eyes. We don't know if she was cross-eyed. We don't have that information. Mm. But it was clear she was not as beautiful as Rachel. Now, Rachel was desired by Jacob to the point that Jacob was willing to work. Mm. That man worked how many years? Seven years mm -hmm. for this woman only to find out that he did not have Rachel, he had Leah. Now, what that says to me is that her father didn't prize her, whether that was the custom of the day or not, because he says, Levin says, well, the oldest daughter always gets married, but we really realized that Levin was being deceitful. Mm -hmm. He saw how, uh, how good Jacob worked and he wanted to keep him around. But poor Leah, Leah's heart was broken, and every time she had a son, she said, maybe he'll love me. Mm. Maybe he'll see me. But her self-care started to kick in when she was pregnant with Judah, her last pregnancy. She's able to say, praise be to God, not for her torment, not for her humiliation, not for her embarrassment, not for, not for the being kicked to the curb, but she's able to have, in all of those years and after all of those births, be able to say, you know, I, I really want God. I've been wanting Jacob. Mm -hmm. I've been wanting Jacob to see me. But now, and, and, and I want to talk about timing. Leah didn't pick that up right away, did she? She didn't pick it up after the first son, the second son. The third. It was a while. Her pain, her humiliation. Jacob, please see me. Please love me. Mm. That's torment. We didn't get that in Hannah. Mm. All right? Hannah wasn't after her husband's affection. She wanted to know, do I have God's approval? Different makeup. Mm -hmm. But, but, but um, Leah gets to where Hannah was by saying, praise be to God. So I think that when it comes to women, and we can be petty. I don't know if we need to unpack that word, petty, but we, <laughs> but we can be petty. We're the little girl, mm -hmm. we, general we. Mm -hmm. We're the little girls on the playgrounds that say, I'm not going to be your friend, mm -hmm. right? You know, mm -hmm. And then we kind of walk off and leave the little girl who wants to be everybody's friend. And we don't even realize on the playground how detrimental that can be to someone who is tender-hearted or fragile. So, and we do it. We do it now as adults, young adults, old adults. We click. You know, we get into these cliques. Mm. Same people for Sabbath lunch. Same pe families do picnics or whatever. And we get into these cliques where no one else can mm. seem to enter, right? Um, and that creates in us a self-doubt. Am I not good enough? Mm. Um, does that answer your question? Because are you okay with what? 
it's it, been shared. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I don't have much more to say oh, about Hannah. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, also looking at it, like th these scenarios that you've um, given me, the scenarios where um, it's a polygamous situation and polygamy was uh, rampant then. It isn't now, but what, what, what's happening now is that because it, it has been substituted with, with the issue of side, side pieces, side chicks, you know? And um, from my view, I, I, I think at this point, because everyone knows that you, you, you cannot go for another person's man, but does everybody know that? <laughs> <laughs> well, because to a certain extent, the the parties involved know that it is wrong, right? Yeah. And 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 yet, they continue, so that that is also a sign of of self love. Well, no, it, that's really a sound sign of a very wounded spirit. Um, if you find yourself as a woman really engaging in um with a man that is married that's not self-love that's um that's someone who doesn't respect themselves doesn't respect the ordinance of marriage um is just kind of that's that's selfish that's not you know we got we have to really get a definition of love i mm. think first because when we're looking at first corinthians 13 the love chapter when we're also, again, in that scripture of love the na your neighbor as yourself, there is a, there's almost a condition there or almost an expectation that you know how to love yourself well. Mm -hmm. And putting yourself in a position to be a woman in waiting, so to speak. You know, I can't be with you. I got to be with my family, but I'll see you at 9 o'clock at night. You know, that's not self, anything. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's depriving yourself of wholeness and health and um, and particularly today, you know, for, in a clinical conversation, <clears throat> it would be if this was a session, you know, I would say, well, Zar, so you know that your husband is involved with someone else. The next question is, have you been tested for HIV or any other STDs? And this is a great segue into saying, we're not as concerned um, in, in my field. We're concerned HIV has not gone anywhere. But we realize that we've been talking, talking, talking to professional, educated, maybe one or two, three degrees. Mm. But education has nothing to do with the emotional response to life, right? Mm. So we're saying, if you know your partner has been unfaithful, and as we're talking to women, then you're going to have to be tested on a regular basis and sometimes every six months, almost for the rest of your life or for however long your marriage is intact and, and he's seeing someone else. So for the wife and for the mistress, th that, that's a mess, mm. <laughs> you know, in, mm. in, in the 21st century. And someone listening might say, well, you know, I, my parents were in a polygamy. I come from a polygamous um, family where my father had four or five wives. We're talking in context to where we live, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and there are, gosh, Zar, I, I've counseled with women whose husbands have been seeing more than two or three women at the same time, and they belong to our community of faith. Mm. So this is not out there. It's in, in here. here. And so that's why I say it. And it's rampant. And it's, all, and it's almost, unfortunately, um, expected and accepted. Mm. Mm. Expected and accepted. Um, when I was growing up, um, I had uh, an amazing group of great aunts, um, about nine of them. Mm. And I had a cousin, my first cousin, Butch, was a very handsome young man and played football, so he was muscular. He was all that and a bag of chips. Mm. And I remember, I must have been about 14 or 15, and uh, we were living in New York, and we had come to North Carolina to visit with my, it was a family reunion. 
And my cousin Butch had a girl upstairs in his bedroom, and then there was another young woman. We have basements in our, in our homes where the family room is. And he had a, a, a young woman in the basement. And those of us who were 14, 15, and 16, at first we were giggling and whispering mm. amongst ourselves as cousins. But then we were kind of like, wait a minute, he's running up and down the stairs. Do either one of the girls know that there's another girl in the house? And we went to a couple of our aunts, the older women, the wise women. Mm -hmm. And my aunt said, well, you know, boys will be boys mm. in her house. And what that said to me as we're speaking now is that, well, what are we going to do? Mm. And I think that that's a question that we have to ask ourselves individually as women. Um, we know God's heart. It was just Adam and Eve in that garden. That was God's heart. It is sin that has created all this other stuff, adultery, polygamy. It's not God's ideal. We say, oh, but in the beginning, well, that was the beginning, and, and I can't get into what Cain did and was a sister's whatever, but we're talking about right now, this is Sunday, mm. um, 2022, and we're talking about what do we do now at this time in this age as Christian women who when we marry, we're marrying one man and we're hoping that that is going to be the extent of that family. Mm. There will only be children, not another woman, or for men, not another man. Mm. Mm. But when someone else enters, um, enters our family like that, it really crushes and it breaks. That's torment for a woman to know there's another woman somewhere. Mm. Um, and we get that from God. We're created in his image, right? And when he would talk to Israel, he would say, and you've gone after other lovers. Mm. So that, that feeling of emptiness, that feeling of dread, that feeling of hopelessness, doesn't just come from the air. Mm. It's something that God, you know, that love relationship, that committed marriage, and God said, and you shall be one. That's the thing. You shall be one. So, gosh, you know, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking. Some of us recover as women and some of us never recover emotionally or mentally, it mm. can be that tormenting. Bless God we didn't have that with Hannah. Mm. And bless God Leah came around, huh? Mm -hmm. And we hope some other women who are listening today might say, what am I doing? Mm. Um, why am I allowing myself to be involved? Why don't I care more about who I am and who God's called me to be? And we're not promoting separation or divorce in this conversation. Mm -hmm. But what we are suggesting is that it might be time to go get some counseling, particularly if you choose to stay, on how, what tools you can use so you don't lose your mind. Because mm. that's really the truth as well, mm. that you can lose yourself. Um, and God hasn't called us to that. Did I? I hope I answered some of that. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. you did. Um, okay, quickly, we're just going to go into now sisterhood. Um, Mary and Martha. Mm. Yes. Um, the story, we find it in Luke. Um, so Martha, they, they, they get the visitors, and Jesus is among the visitors. And Martha is in the kitchen. She's preparing. She's doing all that she's doing. And honestly, as, as we have all been raised, when mm -hmm. there are visitors, you prepare. Right. You, you, you cannot sit down. You, know? you have to mm -hmm. um, cater for them. So Mary, however, chooses to sit at the feet of Jesus. And Martha looks at the situation and she's like, mm -mm. She has a fit. <laughs> she, she does. She does. And because I think at that time she she just looked at the situation and thought she will call in the third party mm. because this won't work between them so she goes straight to jesus and says tell mary to come help me mm -hmm. i am busy at the kitchen what 
what mm. is she doing here? Mm. And Jesus responds and says, relax, Mary <laughs> has chosen the better the high part. thing. Mm. So mm. looking at the situation from outside, yeah. Martha was right. Well, to, to a degree, she was right, but obviously her timing was wrong. Well, was she right in the sense of tell Mary to come help me? Um, Jesus was a guest of honor. Martha and Mary had been sisters. They, they didn't just start being sisters. Mm -hmm. And she knew Mary's background. Um, she knew Mary had an affinity for the word of God. She knew Mary had a past. Mm. She knew Mary um, wanted a new life. Now, as a biological sister, we really want the best for each other, or we should. So Martha, yes, yeah, she may have needed help. But I, I don't want to look at it in terms of right or wrong here. Jesus doesn't say Mary's chosen the right way. He, she says she's chosen the better part. Mm. And he goes on to say, you know, um, Martha, you're worried about a lot, man. You're worried about too much. Mm. So we have to remember, too, that Jesus had a relationship, a personal relationship with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. He was in and out of their homes. So he knew these individuals much better than we mm. knew. So it probably wasn't the first time he saw Martha running around. Okay, so, you know, he was used to her. You know, there are certain characters in our lives that love control and need to be in control and everything's got to be just right. He probably would have said, Martha, the bread is fine. Just give us bread, mm. you know, but come listen. Mm. I have something I want to mm. share with you too. But I, I do want us to keep in mind, bear in mind, Mary had a past. Mm. Mary didn't want to return to the past. Mary wanted to stay at Jesus' feet because she knew if she didn't stay at his feet, she could find herself back to where she came from. Martha at that time, who knows? She may have been up all day cooking. She mm. was just tired, frustrated. Mm. But there might have been just maybe a little bit of jealousy there. You know, that Jesus is my friend too. Mm, mm. <laughs> you know, who knows? But Spirit of Prophecy tells us, it's very clear, that Jesus rebukes Martha tenderly. There is a time and a place for everything. Do we need to eat? We need to eat. Mm. And Jesus didn't chastise her for cooking. He chastised her for her timing and for she could have come and she could have sat at Jesus' feet as well. It's about priorities. Mm. It's where do we put our priorities? That was the question. So Jesus wanted to know, Martha, your priorities are out of order. Mm. I'm not going to always be here. And Mary has chosen the better part. Does that help? It does. Yeah, because cooking, yeah, we got to eat. And there's always going to be Martha's, but there are always going to be doers. Mary wasn't a lazy child. She was just a girl who realized, I have found the answer. <laughs> I'm not leaving the answer. And, and, you know, it could have been a thing, too. If this wasn't maybe sibling rivalry a little bit, Okay. Martha could have come and said, Mary, can I speak to you outside? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or could I see you in the kitchen? She really didn't have to embarrass or speak to Jesus. And we do that. Mm. Um, as women, sometimes that's that pettiness kind of thing. We'll speak about someone. They're in earshot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they can mm -hmm. hear. Mm -hmm. And we'll be speaking about them out loud, hoping they hear, mm -hmm. as opposed to going to them directly. May God just help us, gosh, just to be who we need to be <laughs> at the time we need to be it. And, and also be sympathetic. I think if Martha had been just a little more sympathetic and realized, you know, my sister has been through a lot. She's been through a lot out there. 
Um, you could say, well, she chose to go through a lot, but the matter is she's been through a lot. She's back with us now. Let's celebrate the fact that she's not out there and we don't know where she is. She's in here and she's chosen the better part. May God give us even that kind of um, perspective with folk. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And one thing that's harmful that we, we really enjoy is gossip. Ooh. Honestly. Where do you think that comes from? I have no clue, but gossip can be really juicy. Juicy and enticing. Mm. And we can put our own take on it mm. and embellish it mm. and add to it. And then we can even start by saying, well, you didn't hear it from me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that also becomes petty, very petty. But it also comes from a wounded spirit, Zah. Mm -hmm. um, broken, broken and wounded people do broken and wounded things. And we really have to keep that in mind. So if I enjoy um, talking about people in a way that's detrimental, it goes back to that thou shalt not kill place. Now, I may not ever pick up an AK-47 and just riddle someone with bullets, but if I am entertaining in um, ripping apart their character and their reputation, it's the exact same thing. It's the exact same thing when we harm one another's spirit by some of the things that we say. And e even if something that we're saying we found out um, might be true, um, we don't need to gossip about it. We don't need to post on Facebook. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm so, um, <laughs> what's the word? I'm not on Facebook or Instagram or um, Twitter. The only thing I'm on is really WhatsApp. But um, it's very concerning, social media mm. platforms, because that's where gossip um, that's where people are gossiping about themselves. Mm. They're putting out so much information. It's almost information overload. And I'm yes. not really sure that it's really always helpful because we have to remember, particularly for young women who are listening or teens, that people tell us what they want us to know. They rarely tell us the complete, authentic, the whole story particularly when it's one good story after the other good story after the other good story. We're not talking about testimonies now. We're just mm -hmm. talking about information. But gossip has become a pastime for us as women. Mm -hmm. we, um, we're watching too many American-based shows, you know. I get saddened when I see, what, we got the Housewives of Durban? Mm -hmm. The Housewives of, of, where else are they? Mm -hmm. Joburg, Cape Town? I don't know, but when you see that we're borrowing um, some of the influences of the West that are not building our spirit by, by any way. If mm. anything, it's, 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 it's um, compromising and complicating the ways that we need to see life. And gossip is painful if, you're on, if, you're, if you are the person being talked about. Mm. And it is also harmful to the people who are doing the talking. Mm. because there's this sense of I'm better, mm -hmm. you know, and generally people who love gossip is because they're hiding something else that's even going on with themselves. Um, ladies, stop. Stop it. <laughs> stop <laughs> gossiping. Stop talking about one another. It really doesn't help. Mm. It doesn't help us. So um, as women, uh, we struggle with desperation. We, um, like, we get influences from, from, from our family members, from our church members even, and um, when they see you after 21, obviously, mm. it's when are you getting married? Mm. When you get married, when, where's the baby? And, and, and all that. How do we guard against um, these sort of influences? You know what, um, it's really important, um, and I want to speak to the older woman if I could. It's really important that we appreciate God's timing. And we may have gotten married at 19 or 20, and some of us may have thought after having gotten pregnant that marriage was the answer. 
uh, marriage is an institution ordained by God, but it's also, we're told, to enter into it wisely. And at 21, we're talking about in the 21st century, we may not be as wise because there's so many other distractions that are going on now. I need to also say that I'm not suggesting that there are not some spiritually mature 21-year-olds out here. But I said spiritually mature mm -hmm. um, and emotionally mature. I would like to say to the older women, <clears throat> if, if we're seeing, if we're in a congregation and we're watching young women and we're feeling like marriage, if that one's too fast mm -hmm. or too loose, so that one needs to get married, that's not the reason to get married. Nor is pregnancy the reason mm -hmm. for marriage. Um, it really isn't. Uh, two wrongs don't necessarily make a right. <clears throat> what needs to happen in that case is continued counseling and guidance and support and encouragement. Um, but we become desperate when we don't know who we are. And we start to listen to influences and we say, well, I'll go get married, but not necessarily because that's even what you really, someone might want to do. Someone might want to travel. Someone might want to be an entrepreneur and have their own clothes shop or be a cosmetologist and be able to do hair. And, you know, we need to be able to find out who our daughters and our nieces, daughters of the heart and daughters of the womb, who they are. Um, personality and giftings and talents and be able to encourage that because marriage is a lifelong gifting that we have to share with someone else. It's a lifelong commitment and many young couple have um, taken on the responsibility of another life, a husband or a wife, without really that being their real want but feeling the pressure that this is something I must do. We used to tease our theology students in, um, at home, particularly if they attended the school, Oakwood University, and, and they would be busy with their studies, their theology studies, because why? They want to go to Andrew Jewish University, they want to go to seminary, and why? Because they want to pastor a church. And it's almost like that their senior year of... Um, of undergrad, they look up and say, oh my gosh, mm. I didn't get married, I need a wife. Do you play piano? Do you sing? <laughs> Come on, let's get married. <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't that frivolous, but it felt like that, mm. that. And so you get married quickly, then you're going through seminary, there are a lot of pressures, you don't know him, he doesn't know you. And, mm. and we have to really guard those, I think we're talking boundaries. We really have to guard Proverbs tells us, guard your heart. We have to guard the avenues of the soul, even when doing a good thing. Because mm. we need to do the good thing for the right reason, with the right person, at the right time. Because it can be the right thing, but if it's at the wrong time, it's the wrong thing. It can be the right thing, but if it's with the wrong person, it's the wrong thing. And we can go back and say, you know, but God can fix you know, why put God in position to fixing as opposed to enriching? So start off in, in the mindset, again, that I want to honor and respect myself and honor and respect the person that God brings into my life. One of the things we as women have to really appreciate is that God knitted you together in your mother's womb. So he's not sitting up in heaven scratching his head like, oof, Zar, we need to find somebody for Zar. <laughs> or she found someone. Now we need to fix it. You know, we, this idea of, Lord, you know me. You really do know me. And I want to be known by you. It's, it's almost like when Paul says, I know nothing else but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Say, so what in the world does that have to do with marriage? Well, it has to do with the fact that once we are in relationship with Jesus Christ, we can trust him. And what can we trust him to do? We don't just trust him for rent. We don't just trust him for tuition. We don't just trust him for another job or another car or another place to live. We trust him with a life made. 
You know, it's Adam that woke up and said, oh, my goodness. Look at you, Eve. You're bone of my bone, flesh of my... God prepared Eve for Adam. He, he knows what he's doing. You say, well, look at Adam and Eve. Well, but, you know, God was a perfect parent. He had two disobedient children, but that doesn't make God irresponsible. Mm. He knows what we need. Here's the other thing about marriage. We are talking about marriage, right? Yeah. Here's mm -hmm. the other thing about marriage. It's a clear word translation. It is, um, that translation was put together by a Adventist um, theologian. I love the second chapter of uh, Genesis in the clear word translation. The second chapter, the translation says Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and God are walking. And they're looking at Adam. Adam is enjoying himself. He's naming the animals. He's doing all that. And God says, I have an idea. I have an idea. Let's create for Adam a suitable, I love that word. Let's create for Adam a suitable companion. And they will represent on earth how we do heaven. Meaning, and I mean that, how we do heaven. Mm. In heaven, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, God the Father, they're in unison. Their goal is the same. And he was saying that marriage is to represent how heaven is done, how heaven operates. They operate, they communicate. Their goal, us. Mm. Their goal is saving us, making sure that we make it in. That's all of their focus on this earth. So God is saying they'll rightly represent us. We'll give Adam a suitable companion. And I, you know, I really want to impress upon you, Zara, and all the other young women living, don't be desperate, listening rather, not living, lis listening. <laughs> desperation is not attractive, and mm. desperation is not necessary. Desperation causes us to do crazy stuff. Mm. Desperation causes us to look at ourselves and start that peeling of we're not good enough. Maybe he didn't because I'm not. No. Mm. Desperation leads us down paths and we can't get back home without being scarred. Mm. The idea is being able to say, Lord, I would like to have a family one day. And let's be clear about why you would. You want to have a family because all your mates now are married mm. and you're tired of being the bridesmaid, mm -hmm. you know? Um, do you want to be authentic and honest with yourself and say, no, I have a bucket list? Mm. You know, I would like to ask every young woman between the ages of 19 and 30, create a bucket list. What are the things that you would like to do that you would like to see? You know, we were talking earlier about a passport. Get a passport. Mm. You just never know when God would invite you. I had, you know, when I was in high school, about 17, 18 years of age, I wanted to graduating. I wanted to be a um, missionary nurse. Mm. That was my, and I was going to Peru. Africa was not on my bucket list. Peru was. Mm. Um, and God just rearranged the routing, right? Mm -hmm. I still, uh, I'm in the health ministry, not as a nurse, but God, but God, that's really what I'm saying is that at 17, I knew what I wanted to do. God accepted, mm -hmm. you know, this prayer of a young girl saying, I just want to be used by you, but he decided how to best use. Mm -hmm. So I just really want to say to young women in particular in this woman's month, be true to yourself, being honest and authentic and original. God has created you to be an original. He's not created you to be a duplicate. And we're running around here trying to be like everybody else but ourselves because we don't know who we are. So number one, desperation is not attractive. Number two, there is create a bucket list. And number three, ask God to bring into your life in the time that he decides is best. Do we disregard what the older women are saying? They mean well, we're not to disregard, but I think that there are boundaries. Mm. There are boundaries, that, and I think that Proverbs, um, I know, 
when Proverbs says, when, when Solomon says, guard your heart, he's talking about that too, the different influences that can create conflict mm. in your heart um, and in your soul. And God is not into conflict. He's into conviction, mm. but he's not into conflict. That's a long answer. Huh? <laughs> it's a long answer about desperation, but desperation will create more problems mm. when we're doing things because we're desperate. And again, it is not attractive. Mm. Amen. <laughs> not attractive. <laughs> now, I'd like to uh, look at the story of Mary, the mother of Jesus. You know, when she got pregnant, obviously she had um, sisters. Maybe it's not biological or even biological who were looking at the situation. And we, we can just imagine how she could have been judged at that point. And um, I, I, I just wonder how that could have played out. Well, we're kind of told how it played out. Mm. You know, God was, you know, when God does something in our lives, he protects us. So there might have been whispering, but we have to remember that um, Mary was literally taken out of her village and sent to be with her cousin, Elizabeth, an older woman in the same situation, except that she had a husband and um, was impregnated by Zacharias. But I think for Mary, we have to remember that Mary also knew the word of God and she knew the book of Isaiah. Because when we read in, the, in Luke chapter 1, we don't really hear her being, um, what's the word? She's in awe. That's really what we pick up, that the angel of the Lord appears and the angel announces and says, please don't be afraid, Mary. You are blessed and highly favored. Now, there was a time where we were walking around talking about I'm blessed and highly favored. Mm -hmm. But we got to be careful about these cliche texts because as we related to Mary and as you're bringing up, she, she might have been when she started to show because we find Joseph, right? And Joseph, when he finds out, not when the village finds out, but mm. when Joseph finds out that she's pregnant, he's, he's, he's beside himself. And one of the things he does is make a decision to hide her away. Now, God sends her to Elizabeth. She comes back and Joseph decides to hide her away. So what that says is that both the Heavenly Father and her husband-to-be were very interested in keeping Mary out of harm's way. Mm. Mary, having known the scriptures, you know, knew that in Isaiah they say a, a virgin will bring forth a son. So she's just awed by the fact that she's that virgin that was chosen. I think she was just so focused, Sar. Um, I think she was chosen because God knew that she knew who she was. We get, um, I think, bent out of shape when we're uncertain about who we are. And I think when she realized it was God, that's different. Her whole situation was very, very different. But I love the fact, and I want to say it again, I love the fact that God had a plan and said, this, this, she's carrying my son. Mm. Mm. Uh, when I was pregnant with my first child, my great aunt used to say, now girl, watch your disposition. Mm. Be happy, because if you're not, your emotions will transfer to that baby. Mm. So God was not about to have her stressed out Okay, mm. perplexed, mm. conflicted. He immediately sent her to a loving, receptive arms of Elizabeth. So there might have been gossip in the village, but again, we go back to how we started. We need to know who we are in Christ. And how do we do that? You can't really know it by singing songs only, by being up front, performing, or having great programs like this, you really got to spend time in the Word and you really got to spend 
personal time with God, whether that be early morning or late evening. Um, we don't have a new idea about getting to know the Father. It is the same. Stay in his word so you can hear. This is the way. Now walk. God bless you. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you so much for, for taking your time and mm. coming here and sharing your wisdom. Um, we really appreciate it. Thank you. And we pray that this word may continue to spread and, and that everyone may grow from strength to strength. Um, that is it for our program for today. And we, we, we would like to have you for the following programs. Please go to our Facebook and YouTube. You can follow, like, comment, and subscribe. We are on there as Cheta Midrand SDA. Um, uh, for a closing, we would like to ask Auntie Gail to close for us in prayer. You know what, Lord, we're so grateful for your presence. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your instruction, your correction, your wisdom. And we pray for those who will be listening. We pray for this production team. And we just give you all the praise and all the glory for being our Father. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. amen. Thank you.